Good morning, uh, and welcome to the meeting of the Subcommittee uh, on Zoning and Franchises. I'm Council Member Francisco Moya, and we are joined today by Council Members Constantinides, Lanceman, Reynoso, Torres, Kredencek, Rivera, and Espinal. Today we will be holding uh, public hearings on a number of items, and we'll be voting on one item. If you're here to testify on any item on the calendar, please fill out a white speaker slip with the Sergeant at Arms and indicate the LU number of the item you wish to testify on on that slip. Before we get started uh, with our business, I wanted to note that the pre-considered item, the 82nd Street rezoning, has been withdrawn by the applicant yesterday afternoon, and so we will not be holding a hearing on the item, and instead we will be voting, uh, voting on a motion to file. Uh, this is a project in my district that has attracted considerable attention, so I wanted to say a few words about it before uh, we get into uh, our other uh, hearings. As the local elected council member, uh, I hear from constituents every day in search of affordable housing, and I understand how urgent the need is for us to find ways to build affordable housing for those most in need. Rezoning is one important tool we as the council have to encourage the creation of new housing and new affordable housing. However, it comes with its own share of challenges. The big challenge we are grappling with is how we grow as a city, how to make room for new immigrants in places like my district, and how to make room for growing families, and how to create housing for people in search of economic opportunity in the city of New York. We need to do this while balancing the legitimate concerns of our community about the impact new housing will have on existing residents, businesses, and the infrastructure. My goal as chair of this committee is to find solutions and compromises to chip away at the extraordinary, extraordinary housing need that we have. Unfortunately, there are times that we cannot reach a compromise, and I do not think that uh, these are days to celebrate, but to refocus on the work ahead of a, uh, uh, on the work ahead of a building, about building a city that is truly more equitable than the one that we have today. So that is what we will be doing here today. So with that, I will, turn, uh, I will turn it to our first hearing, which will be on LU-143, the application by uh, Vida Mexicana, Papacito, for a revocable consent to operate an unenclosed sidewalk cafe at 223 Dykeman Street in Manhattan in Council Member Rodriguez's district. And I now open the public hearing on LU-143. And I believe we have uh, Amy Cohen. Amy Cohen. Amy, going once. Going twice. We're going to check to see if they're outside. No, no, Amy? Okay. Uh, we do have a letter that was submitted by uh, the Vice President of uh, Vida Mexicana, Inc., uh, Wendy Jesus Hernandez. Uh, it says, Dear Council Member Rodriguez, we respectfully submit this letter to the City Council. Please note the following items. Vida Mexicana, Inc. will abide by the Department of Consumer Affairs, DCA, hours of operation at all times, and two, uh, Vida, Vida Mexicana will address any concerns from the community uh, at all times. Uh, sincerely, Wendy Hernandez, Vice President. Are there any members of the public who wish to testify? Okay. Uh, 
Seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application, and we will now vote to approve LU43, uh, Papacito, in accordance with the recommendations of the local member, and we'll lay over uh, oh, uh, with the recommendations of the local member. Council, can you please call the roll? Uh, vote to approve land use item 143, Papacito Cafe, Chair Moya. Aye. Constantinides. Aye. Reynoso. Aye. Oh, land Aye. Rivera. Aye. Torres. I vote aye. Benchik. Aye. The land use item is approved by a vote of seven in the affirmative, no negatives, and no abstentions, and referred to the full land use committee. Okay, now I'm going to uh, open the hearing on LU 141, the application for the post office restaurant for a revocable consent to operate an unenclosed sidewalk cafe at 188 Havermeyer Street in Council Member Reynoso's district in Brooklyn. Uh, I now open the public hearing on LU 144. Are there uh, any members of the public who wish to testify? See, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application, and it will be uh, laid over. Uh, our next hearing is on LU-142, uh, the application uh, by Nobody is Perfect, a revocable consent to operate an unenclosed sidewalk cafe at 234 East 4th Street in Council Member Rivera's district in Manhattan. Uh, I now open up the public hearing on LU-142, uh, and we have Rosa Ruiz, When you sit down, yeah, and just turn on your mic. Yeah. There we go. Good morning, everyone. Let's try this again. Um, this is an application for an unenclosed sidewalk cafe at 235 East 4th Street in Manhattan. Um, we had met with the community board, and we didn't get an approval because there seems to be, you know, a little bit of miscommunication going back and forth, but he is committed to working with everyone, um, and he would really like to be able to have his cafe. So he does have 56 signatures in support, and then people did come out and speak in favor of his application the night that we did go to the community board meeting. Is that it? Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for your testimony. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to turn it over to Councilwoman uh, Rivera uh, for a few comments. So nice to see you again. Um, we just met recently, yesterday, in fact. Um, you know, this is a, it's rare to see a community oppose a sidewalk cafe. Uh, however, the Block Association, and which is called the East 4th Street Lower Avenue B Block Association and the Community Board, made me aware of about 44 noise complaints in about a one-year period. And they also showed me pictures of patrons loudly congregating outside at night and alleged that the operator was violating stipulations of their liquor license. So I wanted to ask, what are you doing to cure that problem and have you been in communication with the Block Association since your first meeting? And when was your first meeting? The first meeting we had with the Block Association, I believe, was in May. Um, and I have, you know, conveyed to Clint and Mark that we would continue, you know, the dialogue, attend the meetings, be more community involved. And then out of those 40, even though you have 44 311 complaints, the majority of them were unfounded. So it wasn't that, you know, I understand why there was 44 calls. There was, I believe, 18 instances where it does say that police action did take place, but 
44 calls, majority not founded. And so what are you going to do about the, the have you installed any additional soundproofing measures? What yes. are you doing about so the crowd there, control? Yes, so there has been additional soundproofing installed. I actually have photos with me if you'd like to see them. And as far as the crowd control, as we were discussing, um, instead of having the people wait there you know, for their table, um, taking their telephone number and then giving them a call or a text, advising them when their table is ready so this way there's no one standing outside. And so you, rather than withdraw your application today and meet again with the Block Association to go over some of these changes and modifications that you're making to improve overall quality of life coming on the block, you <coughs> state that you need the sidewalk cafe. Yes, so he really does need the cafe in order to be able to sustain, because if not, he's going to end up closing his establishment because it's just, it's, it's difficult to run a business, you know, these days, um, this day and age. But it's not that he's just going to, you know, have the cafe and then not meet with the Block Association and continue a dialogue in order to, you know, to better the relationship. So I'm not sure if you're aware, but the Block Association and the board are suggesting that the license be denied and that you come back in about a year so you can prove to be a good neighbor. And so why I'm asking you these questions is because I typically don't like to, to limit an operator from being able to grow their business and expand in a way that's going to actually have them stay in the space. We have a lot of restaurants that turn over. We have a lot of vacant, vacant storefronts. And I want small businesses to thrive in my district. But I also have to put the quality of life of, of, of the tenants first and the residents who, who are there in their neighborhoods. And so they are asking that we deny your license. And so I want you just to, what I, I really want to see is better communication between you and the Block Association. So if you do not get the sidewalk cafe today, um, is it, you're saying that the financial difficulty could close your restaurant yes. to show them, yes. show them your yes. applicant. So, so Are you willing to cut the number of tables and chairs down to yes, limit we, some of the? Yes, we are willing to cut down the number of tables and chairs. So I don't know if you have the diagram in front of you. I do not. Okay. So I have the diagram. Would you like me to take it? Okay. okay. So we're willing to take away six tables and 12 seats. The application is for 32 seats. So that would reduce it by, I believe, by a third. And then also reduce the hours of operation, um, Sunday through Wednesday till 9 o'clock at night. And then Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, the cafe open until 10 p.m. And then also, you know, continue to meet with the Block Association. So I, you know, I can't ignore the, the hyena outreach from the constituents and all of the complaints that have come in, which I, I do have the complaints in front of me and I have a number of letters. You said that you have 56 signatures in, in support. support of the yes. restaurant. Is that what you gathered in order to bring the, the application yes. forward? Yes. Do you have letters in support? I, I do not have actual physical letters in support, but I do have the 56 signatures with me if you'd like that. Have you been in touch? I know that we just spoke yesterday for the first time, and, and you met in May, and I was hoping that there would be a little bit uh, more progress in mm -hmm. the coming months, and now we're on a very strict timeline. Yes. So have you tried to get in touch with the Block Association at least today to try to yes. amend? So, yes, so I have um, spoken with Clint, who's in the audience, and we've discussed a few things. So you'll be meeting yes. soon? <clears throat> okay, and so you're going down from 32 seats to 12 seats. Have you considered just a reduction, 50% reduction? Have you spoken with any of the, the, the constituents to try to figure out the best way to bring the sidewalk cafe without us turning it down? Because right now with the 311 complaints and the organizing that has gone on in the community, rare do you see a block association organize that much against a sidewalk cafe unless the restaurant has been a bad neighbor? No, I, again, I understand you know, completely where everyone is coming from. So it's just, you know, you offered, you know, your office in order to be able to have an open dialogue and, you know, and I think that would be great so that this way there's another intervention. Right, I, I don't want to limit you for frivolous reasons, yes. but this is, this is, it's been pretty serious and they reach out to me repeatedly. So um, I don't have any more questions, Chair Moya. Thank you uh, for allowing me to speak of with course. the applicant. Thank you, Councilwoman Rivera, and thank you um, for your testimony. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next panel here is um, Mark Hannay, Clint Smeltzer, is that it? Smeltzer. And Luis, Lois Ray, uh, Lewis Rayer.
So please state your name and you may begin. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Mark Hannay. I live at 240 East 4th Street, directly across the street from the location of the premises. Uh, my name is Louis Rayer. I also live at 240 East 4th Street, uh, directly across from uh, Nobody's Perfect. My name is Clint Smeltzer. I am vice chair of the CB3 SLA licensing committee. Oh, one other thing I forgot to mention is that I co-chair the Block Association uh, along with Clint. Do you have any? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, this location has been a concern for neighborhood residents uh, since it first converted into a commercial restaurant establishment a dozen years ago. Um, this is the fourth business to come into the space and, uh, and operate there. It's a very large space for typical restaurants in the neighborhood. I think it seats about give or take 100 people. It's been of concern to the residents because um, Back in the early to mid 2000s, there were a number of very um, loud, boisterous late night uh, clubs that existed in the neighborhood uh, that ostensibly operated uh, as restaurants, but were really, in fact, nightclubs. And uh, working with the community board and the state liquor authority, we were able to kind of shut those down. It turned out that some of the establishments were operating without an official liquor license, and some were uh, operating in um, violation of various stipulations of their liquor licenses. So we organized the Block Association really to begin to deal with these situations. Um, this space has been of concern. Um, we met with the applicant uh, a year and a half ago, maybe, not quite by now, when they first applied for their liquor license and were granted it, and we presented them with our usual boilerplate stipulations that we've developed with, in our block association in, in conjunction with the community board um, to make sure that these businesses actually operate as restaurants and do not morph into late night clubs so that we don't have the similar situation that we had initially. There was a lot of back and forth and some tension and uh, Clint can talk in a minute about the negotiations with the community board, but we basically got them to agree to the stipulations and uh, what's happened since then is that probably beginning last winter, um, they kind of changed the character of the restaurant and the clientele that they were seeking to develop to s support the uh, business model, and that was to become a much more boisterous kind of party place. I live directly across the street. My apartment fronts the building. I look down into the place. I experience the direct impacts, and even in the winter, with the win windows closed both on my apartment and their front, the front of their place can open up op into the street. Um, it was quite loud and boisterous, uh, particularly on uh, Saturday and Sunday afternoons and on weekend evenings, well into the evening. And they were never, even when they had the windows and doors open in warmer weather, they uh, did not close them at 10 p.m. as required. Um, they were uh, playing very loud music. The stipulation said that they had originally agreed to said that it was going to be just sort of background ambient music. Uh, they have a very much kind of a party scene going on there where people cheer and clap and sing along with the music loudly. And um, it's, they get a clapping thing going that speeds up, which reminds me of people sort of drinking shots, uh, although I have not witnessed this myself. Um, and so this is all became of concern. Um, I myself, at the very beginning, when the restaurant first opened, made some calls to the management when these situations would occur and was rebuffed and treated as if I was a nuisance. Um, and I've heard this from other uh, neighbors that have done the same. So I literally, at some point, just stopped calling. And, I, and I'm one of those people that filed the number one a number, have filed a number of 311 complaints over the years because that's the only thing I can do. Um, 
when the sidewalk application came forward to the community board, uh, we uh, met with the applicant again. Um, we had a very large turnout for the meeting, which was not typical for our meetings when we uh, consider such matters as this. Um, it was a very contentious meeting with the applicant. Um, they really pushed back on a lot of what we were saying about what we were witnessing and experiencing. Um, they challenged us on a lot of our contentions and um, they did not appear particularly to be cooperative in terms of negotiating anything out around the sidewalk cafe. So we then recommended to the community board that they recommend to you folks that the application for the sidewalk cafe be denied. Thank you. Do and oh, to respond to what the previous speaker said, to the best of my knowledge, we have not been approached about a subsequent meeting or agreed to any particular meeting, although we would certainly be open to that option. Do any of you wish to testify as well? Or I, I, I don't, Mark pretty much covered it, but I also live on the street side. And as it stands now, the, 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 the front opens up extensively, and so, um, it is quite noisy, and now that the neighborhood seems to have embraced a brunch scene, uh, the noise will start at 12 p.m. noon and thumping all the way to the evening. So now, whereas it used to be around dinner time, now it's extended. So um, when we saw the, 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 the cafe, uh, they were gonna apply for a, for a permit to the cafe, we thought that would be a big problem because it already is a problem. The storefront is, the restaurant essentially opens up anyway, I would say, 50 to 60 to 70 percent of the front opens up with with hinged windows so um if that is extended out into the sidewalk with no barrier whatsoever we thought that it's just going to amplify it's going to be even worse so that's all i think mark covered it otherwise I, so, I, be, be, yeah before we begin we're going to start with the two minute clock okay no okay. I'm, I'm actually going to be quick they pretty much summarized everything i just want to speak from the community board side we don't usually deny sidewalk cafes because they're not usually that much of a problem. However, in this situation, because of the complaints from the residents, and they were basically violating almost every stipulation that they agreed to with the SLA. So because it was so egregious, and the residents that had tried to work with them did not receive a positive response in any way, some of them were you know, sworn at and chased away, basically. So because of that, as the community board, we decided to flat out deny, not even issue with stipulations. So that's kind of how it got to this extreme position. We weren't asking ever for them to be, to never apply for a sidewalk cafe. It was simply to prove that you can operate within your existing stipulations and follow the rules, and then we're more than willing to work with you. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Councilwoman Rivera for a few questions. <clears throat> Yes, thank you all for being here. Um, good to see you. So I understand it's been a problem for many, many years, but I just want to focus on this application. Um, and so I want to go back to, to your comment. I know that and I, Rosa approached maybe Clint this morning. Yes. Oh, so minutes to, ago. To answer, yeah. So and Mark said he. It was just earlier when Rosa and I were speaking. We haven't set up a meeting. She did say, you know, we've talked about this. We're willing. We haven't actually set anything up, but we'll see what comes out of that is the next. Okay, the, the only thing I would ask is that if you can try to, to get together and figure out if there's something, there's a couple of things that I think they should agree to do, really close their windows by 10 p.m. the way that they agreed to, and figure out how to do some crowd control with the people that are waiting for their table for brunch or whatever it is. Um, I know other restaurants do it, there are apps, there you can make a call, um, and so I would just encourage if you all can maybe get together in the next couple weeks, and I'm happy to, to help provide a space for that. Um, I would really appreciate it, just so we could figure this out and, and hopefully have a small business that can last that is not you know, bothering the rest of the block. Sure. Thank you. I think we'd be willing to work with your office on that. Thank you. That's it. Okay. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Seeing none, uh, I now close the public hearing on this application, and this application will be laid over.
So, Council, will you please call the roll for um, one LU-143? Uh, continued vote to approve LU-143. Council Member Levin. Vote aye on all. The vote now stands at eight to approve zero abstentions and no uh, negatives. Got it. Uh, our next public hearing is on LUs 147 and 148, the East 33rd Street rezoning. Applicant 33rd Street Acquisitions LLC seeks a rezoning map change from an R8A to C19A and a zoning text amendment to apply MIH option one to the rezoning area, which is in Council Member Rivera's district in Manhattan. Uh, I now open up the public hearing on this application and ask the council to uh, swear in the applicant team. Uh, we are now gonna call up Dan Eagers, Mark Weprin, our former colleague, um, Michael uh, Hel Hellitz, did I say that correctly? And Michelle Murado Ikowski. Oh, thank you. Council. Well, uh, good morning. I'll, st I'll start. It's uh, one nice. Second. Okay. One second. I'll wait for the finger. <laughs> Hopefully, it's the right one. No, we need the council to uh, swear you in. Um, do you each affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and you, that you will answer all questions truthfully? And um, before you answer, please state your name into the mic. We do. I do. You guys do. I do. <laughs> Michelle Ikowitz, I do. Dan Eggers, I do. Ready? Okay. So just, uh, I just wanted to... Wish everyone a good morning and thank, thank you for having us here today uh, for this rezoning uh, on 33rd Street. Uh, just to give you uh, context of who everyone is up here, uh, Michelle, who you introduced, is a landlord tenant attorney for the, uh, for the client, Michael Hellitz, who's next to me. Uh, and Dan Eggers to my right is a land use counsel at Greenberg Trowig. My name is Mark Weprin, and I am an attorney at Greenberg Trowig. And it's really uh, impressive to be here today. It's like an all-star team of the city council looking around on this all-star game day. Lattery will get you everywhere. Okay, I work on that. I, you notice I waited till Grudenchik left to say that. I wanted to be clear on that. No. Um, so what, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna quote, turn it over to Dan, who is gonna give, us, give the presentation, and then we'll be happy to answer any questions. Good morning, Chair Moya, Council Member Rivera, Council Members. This is an application by 33rd Street Acquisition, LLC, to rezone a portion of the north side of East 33rd Street between 1st and 2nd Avenues from an R8A to a C19A district. The rezoning would be subject to mandatory inclusionary housing and would facilitate the provision of up to 40 affordable housing units in a 23-story, approximately 123,000 square foot building with ground floor retail and residential above. Also here today, in case you have any questions, is Shay Alster, the project architect, and Christina McKellian from Phil Habib and Associates, the environmental consultant. Our client owns the property at 339 to 343 East 33rd Street. That's lots 24, 25, and 26, and is negotiating purchase 345 East 33rd Street. That's lot 27. He's also negotiating to purchase approximately 16,000 square feet of development rights from lot 23. The four buildings on the property our client owns or may own contain a total of 40 dwelling units, of which 10 are subject to rent regulation. As you can see on the tax map, the proposed rezoning would extend the existing C19A district mapped along the blocks 34th Street and 1st Ave and Second and sorry, First Avenue frontages, an additional 200 feet into the mid block to encompass the four development site lots, the development rights parcel, and three out parcel lots. That's lots 20, 21, and 22, and a portion of lot 28. Here are conceptual renderings: one showing a building on all four lots, that's the building on the left, and one showing a building on just the three lots that our client currently owns, that's the building shown on the right. 
There would be 117,000 square feet of residential floor area, which the application proposes would be subject to MIH option one, which requires that at least 25 percent of the residential floor area be set aside permanently for affordable housing units for residents whose incomes average 60 percent of AMI. There would be approximately 155 dwelling units, so 25 percent would equal about 39 units. Our client intends to seek 421A tax benefits, and since there are currently 40 dwelling units on the site, the required replacement ratio requires that there be 40 affordable units provided. We believe there's a sound land use rationale for the rezoning. First, the 23-story height of the building would be in context. There are several other buildings in the surrounding area that are at least 23 stories, including the 21-story Kipps Bay Towers directly to the south, which is a comparable height, 23-story building east of First Avenue. And it wouldn't even be the tallest building on the block as there's a 36-story building on the corner of 2nd Avenue and East 34th Street. While C19A and C19A districts are usually mapped along avenues and not mid-blocks, this is a unique mid-block condition where extending the C19A district into the mid-block is justified. One reason is that East 33rd Street between 1st and 2nd Avenues is a wide street as defined by the zoning resolution. At 80 feet wide, it's actually wider than Lexington Avenue, which is 75 feet wide. The blocks fronting Lexington between East 33rd and 34th Streets are zoned C19, which permits the same maximum FAR as the proposed C19A district, but has no height limit, while the proposed C19A district would have a 230-foot height limit. No other portion of East 33rd Street is this wide. In sum, the proposed rezoning to a C19A 12 FAR district would allow development of a new mixed-use building that would address demand for housing at varying income levels by providing 40 affordable housing units and local retail space in this community. I thank you for your consideration and welcome your questions. Thank you. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, this project is being built across the street from a major hospital uh, in our city, and First Avenue is a heavily trafficked street in the area. Uh, how will this project contribute to the congestion uh, in this area? Our environmental consultant could speak in more detail about this, but we believe that it would contribute minimally. The projected car ownership would be very low. This is a rental building. It's not proposed to be a luxury condo. I believe we estimate that there would be 25 cars generated by the project. And we've done a study and we found that there's parking resources in public garages in the immediate vicinity that could handle the, the parking demand. So we, we, we believe that there would be a, a minimal effect on, uh, on traffic congestion and, and parking in the area. Uh, what work is being done to address uh, the concerns that were highlighted in the borough president's report? So the, the borough president's report specifically referenced two tenants in the buildings that our client owns. And to speak specifically to that, I turn it over to Michelle Murado Itkowitz, the client's uh, landlord tenant counsel. Yes, Hi, I'm Michelle Itkowitz. Um, so there were, there are, th in this, these 23 units, three were rent controlled and two of the rent controlled tenants have been quote unquote bought out. Both tenants are being represented by very experienced uh, tenant council and one got a very large buyout and left and another is being, uh, the buyout has taken the form of an apartment in Florida that a condo that was bought for that person and that person is being um, the process of finishing the the paint colors and buying him a car and those details are being worked out the other rent control tenant is uh, represented by another very reputable tenant council and there are no negotiations going on with that person I think Dan correct me if I'm wrong that covers what was what the borough president was concerned about the rent control tenants the and, and specifically two tenants that that were that were mentioned in that report 
and we, we address both of them. Uh, oh, okay. So then we have another rent-stabilized tenant who has been in just perpetual litigation with the applicant. Where we are right now is that there really aren't any discussions about buyouts going on with the rent-stabilized tenants. There's really not anything going on. I've heard through the grapevine, although no attorney has stepped forward, that they're all represented by, again, very uh, household name kind of famous tenant a buyout attorney, except for one person, and that's the one person in the borough president's report that she was concerned about. So this person just keeps approaching my client over and over saying, I want a big buyout, I want a big buyout. And he's just not ready to do buyouts until the whole group comes, until he moves further through this land use process to have an idea where it is. So it's kind of just the tenants are paying their rent, repairs are being done, no one has any harassment complaints. But this one tenant, so she doesn't pay her rent because she somewhere along the line someone told her it was a good idea to not pay her rent to try to move the applicant toward giving her a buyout. So periodically we've had to sue her in housing court for the rent. Each time she's paid all the rent at the 11th hour. Um, in the second case she was given a small abatement because I believe uh, the something with the boiler was out that uh, winter but she was given uh, it was back on but the housing court gave her a small abatement. Thereafter, her attorney, she was represented not by legal aid, but by private counsel. And uh, private counsel made an application for legal fees to say that they were the prevailing party. We defeated that. The housing court judge decided that there was no prevailing party, so she wasn't avoided, uh, awarded fees. And once, as we stand here right now, I think she owes how many months? 13 months. 13 months, and we're back in housing court. We're currently on uh, trial before Judge Stoller. So it's, it's very isolated incident, the, the relationship with this particular tenant. We'd be happy to avail ourselves of a meeting with, an, with anyone from the council who wants to meet with uh, ourselves and this tenant. Um, but right now, it's just really actually a very routine non-payment situation that I think has at its roots the fact that this tenant thinks that if she doesn't pay the rent, it's going to speed up a buyout situation. But really, these things have their own pace, as, as you well know. So um, other, otherwise, all is quiet at, at the building. Can I answer any questions on that? Was I clear? So just uh, one follow-up to that. How many uh, of the eight tenants uh, have already agreed to a buyout? Is 23 units um, over three buildings. 12 were vacant, long vacant when we got there. Eight are rent stabilized and one did- Out of did, the eight that are rent stabilized. Out of the eight that are rent stabilized, one did take a buyout, but that was a person who actually lived in Connecticut. I brought a routine uh, not a non-primary residence case and the person came in very quickly and said, you got me, handed over the keys. I think we paid for their moving expenses um, just to, have a non-litigation result. And so the other seven, we're not, we're not even in communication with them at this time. It's okay. all quiet. Okay, thank you. Um, last question, uh, what is the commitment uh, to good jobs on this project? Yeah, we, we've been, uh, Working with 32BJ, and as of last night, um, we have a signed agreement with 32BJ, and we're going to be working with them. I see a number of purple shirts behind me. I think they're planning on testifying here today. Thank you. Uh, I'm now going to turn it over to uh, Councilwoman Rivera for questions. Thank you all for being here. Good to see you. Um, you mentioned that one of the tenants there, you said she received an abatement. Yes, I think it was 12%, perhaps. And why did she receive, that was mandated by the court? Yes. Why did she receive an abatement? That winter, for a period of time, the boiler was out while it was being replaced. The tenant was given alternative heating systems in the meantime, but my experience is 22 years as a landlord and tenant lawyer is when a housing court judge hears boiler out, it's going to equals some type of an abatement. I'm not arguing with the judge's result, but I, that's why I also added the part about the end, how council moved 
uh, to be deemed the prevailing party because oftentimes what you see is tenants have to withhold rent in order to get repairs. So then even a small abatement might be considered them being the prevailing party. But the housing court judge in this case agreed that she wasn't the prevailing party because, and she actually says in her legal fee decision, denying legal fees, this, is, this tenant is withholding rent in order to speed up a conversation about a buyout that she would like to have. The reason why I'm asking is because in the borough president's uh, resolution, there were some allegations of harassment. Now I know there are tools um, in order to clear a building and one of them you're using wh which are buyouts. And so I just want to make sure that you're going on record as saying that if this was further investigated that there would be no other, like no other tenants will be able to substantiate what would be reflective of landlord harassment. I'm comfortable going on record saying that because the other tenant that lives in the same building as the tenant we're talking about, he didn't have any complaints at all living in the same building. Also, again, there's no tenant association in this building that I'm aware of, and no council other than the one I've talked about so far has come forward, but, it, but I've heard through the grapevine that they're all represented by a very reputable council, and nobody's, there's, there's no complaints. There's no HBD complaints. There's no complaints of harassment. And in the beginning, we started this project by, uh, right after we bought it, uh, pursuant to the Housing Maintenance Code, the anti-harassment warnings you're supposed to give to say, if you don't want to talk about a buyout, you don't have to. Uh, you're, ha uh, you're, you're entitled to a lawyer. Um, the HPD ABCs of housing pamphlet, I actually gave it to them. So, and I, I CC'd that to then Councilwoman Mendez's office. So it was just from day one, it was like, let's talk, let's be open, let's be in communication. And it, it really does seem to be isolated to this one tenant. I can go on record and say there are, there are no other allegations of harassment. And if, if it was investigated further, I don't think any would be found. Okay, so you have control over three lots. So you're saying seven of the tenants that remain in, in, in these three buildings are stabilized. One is rent control, from what I understand. But, uh, I'm going to say two are rent control because the guy that's got an apartment in Florida hasn't a f he, he he wants to wait till September to move so he's still there so there's okay. two rent control tenants okay so if you're not able to come to buyout agreements with all of them and I understand that communication has ceased since they've right. retained representation are you standing are you going to offer them long-term leases and relocation costs during construction are you going to have them come back to the building I'm going to turn that lease? over yes so council member um the the applicant is a So the, the applicant is amenable to a circumstance in which the remaining tenants would have the right to be relocated back into the proposed building at, at negotiated rents um, that would be less than the rents that would be charged to the, the market rate tenants, although perhaps greater than the rents uh, that they're currently paying. And what, what we are proposing, uh, what we've come up with is um, a rent of $1,500 a month for a period of five years. And just to give you some frame of reference, the average rent paid by the rent stabilized tenants currently is $1,390 a month. So it, it, would, it would be a little higher um, than they're currently paying, but that's, that's something that we're, we're prepared to offer um, should, should the tenants want to avail themselves of that. As for uh, tenant relocation, um, during the period of construction, uh, the, the applicant will move the tenants to a similar apartment in a comparable building in the area, would pay the tenants moving expenses, and would subsidize the difference between the rent that they're currently paying and the rent that they would pay in the apartment to which they're relocated. Um, so if they don't take the buyout, you're gonna relocate them, expenses paid, and then have them come back to the brand new building at a lease for $1,500 for five years. Should they, should they wish to do that, yes. Why only five years? That's and after that, what happens? Well, a after that five-year period, the, the rents would, would go to the, the market rent that we'd be charging the, the other units. But if, if you would like to have a discussion about perhaps extending that period of time beyond five years, I think that's something that, that we can talk about further. Yeah, yeah, I would like to for you to consider that. I mean, five years goes by like that. They just move, then they move again. 
and then they have five years to get it all together and find another unstabilized unit. I don't know what their background is, I don't know what their income is, but I imagine if you have a $1,300 apartment and you're doing everything by the book, you're not swimming in cash. So have you clarified with HPD whether these tenants can return to the units as applicants? Have you spoken with HPD about this potential agreement or is this just something between you and the tenants themselves? So we've, we've reached out to HPD to see if the existing tenants could be given a preference in the affordable housing lottery for the mandatory inclusionary housing units. And we're not, we're not exactly sure that HPD has the discretion or the authority to do that, but we've asked them to consider that. And um, we've, um, so we, we've, we've made that request and we will continue to follow up on that, on that specific uh, ask. Okay, I have a question about, about the lot. I know that um, you are looking to rezone an area that includes lots that aren't subject to the development proposal itself, and I know that's typical, and I think you had mentioned to me once that DCP had asked you um, to, to look at a, a bigger area. So is this practice, is this general practice simply because the lots are abutting, or, or why are you, why do you have a bigger area than the lots that you actually own? City planning, I'd ask that those three out parcel lots, which I'm showing on the tax map, 20, 21, and 22, be included in the rezoning area because they felt that it made sense from um, this per the perspective of the rationality of the zoning map and from um, a, a, a land use rationale as well. So that's why those lots are included. It's, it's not something that, that we propose. It's, it's a, something that originated from city planning. And for the lot that you are trying to acquire, what exactly are the issues at play with the acquisition? So what, what happened here is that um, somebody got wind of the rezoning and in a classic New York uh, scenario, they're acting as a spoiler. They, they came in and they, they purchased uh, the lot and they're, they're holding out for, for money. Um, and what, what also con um, complicates the acquisition of that lot is that the lot is actually divided between a fee parcel and a fee above a plane parcel that was created back in the 1980s. So, in, so one would have Mike, Michael would have to acquire both pieces, and that's something that he's seeking to do. But it's something that has um, taken a while and, and has turned uh, into a complicated situation. Because if you don't acquire the fourth lot, have you considered the contextual problems? You're going to have this big building sandwiched between these little buildings. So I'm curious as to kind of, do you think that's, that's, that's going to be a big issue for the residents there? So are you in negotiations? Is it close to being acquired? So it's something that, that um, our client is actively working on. But, but what, I, what I would say is that this condition exists in, in many places in Manhattan where you have two tall buildings and a, a smaller one in between. And I, I would also say that rezonings occur even where there is no immediate plans for development on a particular parcel, but because it's determined that from a land use rationale and a planning standpoint, that particular zoning district makes sense on that, on that parcel. So I, I would say that the land use rationale supporting the rezoning would, would exist um, whether or not um, our client is able to redevelop that, that, that fourth parcel. And you've spoken to the neighbors across the street, Kipps Bay Towers, about the construction and we, potentially what could happen on their block? So, so we, we reached out um, at the time yeah, we were going to the community board to the Kipps Bay Association and the Kipps Bay Neighborhood Alliance, a number of whose uh, residents, I believe, live in those, in those buildings. And we, we offered them a briefing. And they didn't take, up, t take us up on the offer, though, but they were at the, they were at the community board. And, we spoke to them then. We haven't specifically discussed with them construction staging, but that's something that we'd be happy to do, and should this um, application be approved, we would be happy to hold briefings in the neighborhood and, and work with the community to make sure that construction occurs in a way that is not, uh, is not disruptive to them. I mean, it's a lot of tenants in, in Kibbs Bay Tower, so I would just say please be in touch with the board, and if you need any assistance in communicating with them, my office is happy to assist you. So my last question, of course, is probably the most important, and it has to do with the affordability of the project itself. 
So the community board, the borough president, and I have all requested additional affordable units be included as part of the, of the development. So the borough president asked for 10 additional units total, and community board six requested that 40% of the project be affordable. And so are you prepared, from, from what I've heard, you are going to do 25% at 60 AMI? I wanna make sure that I heard that correctly. Yes, that's correct. That's, that's, that's what we've proposed. So I am going to say what I think I've been saying to you uh, since the beginning is that 25, you know, years and years and years, communities have had to take this 80-20 nonsense, which is clearly just exacerbated the affordable housing crisis and the homeless shelter problem that we have. And so I'm asking that you add additional units according to the community board, the borough president, my ask. I mean, we really do need more affordable units, 25% at 60 AMI. While 60 AMI might be appropriate for the, the area itself, 25% is really, really low considering that you are going to put a very large building on top of units that are still occupying tenants. So I know that you're gonna get all your ducks in a row, that you're gonna to speak to the tenants, that you're gonna take care of them, that you're gonna reach out to the community groups and make sure that you're gonna have the lightest impact construction phase possible, but the affordability of the project itself is absolutely the most concerning thing to me. So we really have to, I guess, go back and, and, and talk a little bit about how we can up those units because um, you are, clearly taking advantage of tax breaks, and I realize the financial viability of the project is important to your applicant, but what's most important to me is that with these tax breaks, with these public dollars, comes a public benefit. Understood, and we, we are prepared to look into providing additional affordable units, and we want to have further conversations with you about, about how to do that. Thank you, and thank you, Chair Moyer, for asking about the good jobs. I'm glad that you are in um, talks with uh, 32BJ. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Rivera. Uh, we have questions from Councilmember Reynoso, and we are also joined by uh, Councilmember uh, Richards. Yeah, so, it's a, so my question is just one question. Um, Councilmember Rivera speaks to uh, wanting 40% affordable housing, as does the borough president. And it seems like the elected officials across the board, 40%. And in one of your replies or responses to a question rela related to a rent stabilized tenant uh, getting a five year deal for an apartment at $1,500 uh, a month, and that after five years it would go away and there would be market rate, um, it's just shocking that they're asking for 40%, and you're looking to take the one apartment that is rent stabilized and fold it into the affordable housing that would happen under MIH instead of taking the responsibility on your own. Um, and when I hear that, it makes me think that you're not taking the 40% serious. Uh, to be honest, you're not taking 26% serious um, seriously. So imagine what the 40% looks like. Um, why is it that that one rent stabilized apartment at least, we can't just check the box for putting it at 1500 and then letting it be rent stabilized, maintain it as a rent stabilized building that goes up um, in perpetuity according to the rent guidelines board. Um, why not do that? Instead of giving you know, five years and think you're doing us a favor, um, why not just rent stabilize it? Wanna try? <laughs> well, Councilman, we understand and, and um, we understand the need for affordable housing. Community board, in the community board hearing, while it came out in the report, that was not raised at the community board as 40%. You know, the number, you know, when you guys passed, when MIH was passed by the city council, uh, those numbers weren't pulled out of the sky. They're done on, you know, with, econ with economists and how much can be done affordability-wise. This particular project, uh, based on the numbers, especially it has these added factors of we're still negotiating to buy a building. He's still we're not sure how much he's going to have to pay the tenants who may be re relocated. Um, all these factors are playing into the fact that, you know, we got to have estimate costs and what can be done. In addition, this this zoning currently would allow, if he was to build as of right, he could take the buildings and actually double the size of the current buildings and build as of right about 12 stories um, as opposed to the 21 here now. And I know you know people always love to throw that out. Oh, I could do this as of right, but the economics of this thing really makes sense at a certain tipping point. So why we are absolutely willing to work with the council member and all of you on trying to negotiate 
how to take care of the tenants who are in there now, make sure they're protected. 25% um, is really a, an important number for us. Um, brand new, by the way, brand new, fire safe, people who all have the income levels that are required. Currently, there are people in this building who may not. Um, not subject to state legislature, permanent affordable housing. Um, so, you know, we're going to negotiate it, but uh, a 40 percent number, to be perfectly frank, is just not possible in any way, shape, or form, even less than that. But we're, we're willing to talk and try to figure out a place that economically works for, for our client, for, for Mr. Hellitz, mm -hmm. um, but also understands, deals with the issues you're raising today. So while I will defer to the local council member's decision here, if you don't get that rent stabilized tenant protected long term, the way they are right now, this is something that's gonna be very hard for me to be supportive of. That just one tenant would make it very difficult. If you don't protect them the way they're protected right now under state law, by having that rent stabilized apartment for as long as they live there, only renewing leases the way, they, they found a, a gem in that and um, I wanna make sure that that's preserved. But the second thing I wanna say is, I would love to see your numbers. You say you can't do it, why don't you be transparent and show us how much money you're gonna make off this project and how hard it is it for you and how little money you're gonna be making for giving us 40% affordable housing. I would love for you to give me that information so that I, could, so that I can um, sympathize and empathize with you. I would love that. Uh, duly noted, thank you. Thank Oops. you. It, there's no clapping here. You can put your hands up and wave if you like. There you go. Thank you. Thank you for. Thank you, Councilman Reynoso. Okay. So, thank you very much uh, to the panel for their testimony today. Thank you very much. And I'm going to call the next panel. Pascal. Uh, I'm going to ask the council to uh, call the vote uh, right now for Council Member Richards. A continued vote to approve land use item 143. Richards. I vote aye. The application is approved by a vote of nine in the affirmative, zero negative, and no abstentions, and referred to the full land use committee. Thank you. Uh, Pascal and Adam Hennett. Hanky. Hanky. Yeah, so each of you will have uh, two minutes. Uh, and we can begin with you, Pascal. Uh, if the Sergeant at Arms can just set the clock to two minutes. Good morning, Chair Moya and members of the committee. My name is Pascual. I, am a, I work as a porter, um, <clears throat> and I've been a member of SCIU Local 32BJ for two years. I am here today on behalf of the residential members of Local 32BJ. Over 30,000 people who clean, maintain, and provide concierge service at apartment buildings throughout this great city. New York's cost of living is one of the highest in the country, and we believe that working people should not have to be asked <clears throat> to do more with less. We believe that all developers should commit to providing good building service jobs that pay workers the industry standard prevailing wage and benefits. We are happy to report that 33rd Street Acquisition LLC, an affiliate of Excel, has made a commitment to providing building service workers with good jobs that will <clears throat> help them put extra food on the table and save a little bit more for retirement. This development will, not, uh, will <clears throat> uphold the standards that building service workers have fought for. That is why we are urging the council to support this project. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Adam Harkey. I am the Vice Chair of Community Board 6 Land Use and Waterfront Committee. On March 14, 2008, Community Board 6 passed a resolution regarding the proposed rezoning on 33rd Street. The resolution objected to the proposal as presented unless 40% of the residential square footage as dedicated, uh, be dedicated to permanently affordable housing. The resolution passed 36 to 1 to 1. 
The resolution highlighted CB6's commitment to affordable housing and the unique case that this rezoning allows. Testimony to CB6 during the process showcased, showcased the urgent need for more affordable housing options within the district. The proposed rezoning will increase the maximum re residential FAR uh, of these lots from 6 to 12 and will trigger MIH a provision and allow commercial usage, which are currently prohibited. This site is rather unique to CB6 in that it is situated on a wider than normal street, 80 feet, with minimum, sh minimum shadow impacts. Further, it is one of the few sites that can be upzoned that will trigger MIH in the district as existing R10 districts and their commercial equivalents cannot be rezoned to trigger MIH. And mid-block redistricting uh, faces narrow streets and already approved and are already appropriately zoned. Based on these facts, CB6 implores the developer increase the amount of affordable housing for the rezoning to move forward. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your testimony today. Um, this panel is dismissed. So, um, are there any other uh, members of the public who wish to testify? Seeing none, uh, I now close the public hearing on this application and it will be uh, laid over. Uh, our next hearing is on the 1601 decal rezoning, uh, pre-considered LUs C180148 uh, ZMK and N180490 ZRK. The applicant 1601 decal uh, avenue owner LLC seeks a zoning map change and a zoning text amendment to apply MIH options one and two to the rezoning area, which is in Council Member Espinal's district in Brooklyn. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application and we, we are turning it over to Councilwoman Rivera for a statement. Uh, regarding pre-considered LU 2477, my husband's currently employed by Canberra Property Group LLC as the Director of Operations. Canberra Property Group will be leasing the property at Block 3237 upon conclusion of the zoning application. For these reasons, I elect to recuse myself from the vote on pre-considered LU 2477. Thank you, Councilwoman Rivera. Uh, I now want to turn it over to Councilmember Espinal uh, for some uh, opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first and foremost, I just want to say how great it is to see Bushwick out in City Hall today. Thanks for joining us. Um, our neighborhood of Bushwick is under tremendous pressure from the real estate market, with rent and displacement pressure continuing to rise and threaten the ability of longtime residents to stay in their homes. For over four years, Councilmember Reynoso and I have supported community residents and organizations in the Bushwick Community Plan process to develop a comprehensive and inclusive plan for the neighborhood's future. This is the first private rezoning application to advance during this time and proposes rezoning of manufacturing zoned land to residential, an issue that has been very contentious within the community, as they have legitimate concerns about job displacement and loss of local businesses. As a result, this proposal has attracted significant opposition from local stakeholders many of whom are here today, who believe that development should, should more accurately reflect the community's goals and serve more of our low-income families who are in desperate need of affordable housing. Let me be clear, there was not nearly enough consultation with the residents of Bushwick who would stand to be affected most before the decision was made to proceed with this ULIP application. But as the project has moved through the process, I have seen encouraging signs that this developer is willing to substantially modify the proposal in a way that is responsive to the community's vision. 
I look forward to hearing from the applicants about their ideas for improving this proposal and from the many members of the community who are concerned about the future of the neighborhood and continue to advocate for a more inclusive and equitable future for Bushwick. Thank you, Council Member Espinal. Uh, I now ask the Council to swear in the panel. Do you each swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? Before answering, please um, turn your mic on and state your name as well. I do, Richard. I do, Richard Vass. I do, Rick Gropper. You may begin. Um, Chair Moya, council members, uh, thank you for hearing us this morning. I'm Richard Bass. I'm a planning consultant uh, with Ackerman LLP. We're here today to discuss a uh, rezoning application for 1601 DeKalb Avenue. Uh, the site is currently uh, zone M11. Uh, it's been zone M11 since 1961. Our proposal today is to change the M11 to an R7A, a C24 commercial overlay, an R7A, and an R6B. The site is located just south of Wyckoff between Hart and DeKalb. As you can see from the zoning map, uh, the neighborhood is primarily residential. Uh, this M11 is a uh, remnant from the 61 zoning resolution. There hasn't been manufacturing uh, in, on, in this area for at least 20 years. Here's a zoning map that shows what I call a little thumb of the M11 into the R6. Here's a tax map that shows the various designations I described, uh, starting from the south, uh, four lots will be R6B, which will allow for transition. The development site will be R7A plus R6B, and then on the Wyckoff frontage is R7A with a C24 uh, commercial overlay. Uh, this is sound planning principles, bringing the, the rezoning to Wyckoff, which has a subway located at the corner of DeKalb in Wyckoff. Here's the zoning map change. On the left is the existing M11. Uh, on the right is the proposed R6B, R7A, R7A with a C24 commercial overlay. I'm going to turn it over to the president of Canberra, my client, who will describe the significant changes that this project has undergone uh, through the Euler process, as the council member has described. Uh, he'll describe the changes to the project and the affordability. Thank you, council members and uh, Chair Moya. I'm Rick Gropper, one of the principals of Camber Property Group. Camber is a majority developer of affordable housing. We have um, completed about 2,000 units, both new construction and preservation of, um, of affordable throughout New York City. The, the project today um, has undergone a significant change as we've gone through the ULERT process. The proposed project consists of 121 units, and um, we have uh, committed to doing the project as 100% affordable. We're also committed to hiring from within the community, practicing sustainable design and um, construction throughout the process, including the inclusion of green roofs and other sustainable design features, and um, reaching out to the community throughout the ULERT process as well as um, for the into the future as we construct and complete the building. As I mentioned, there have been um, significant concerns that were expressed by the community and um, we have um, been involved in a very spirited debate about um, a number of issues. The, the main issues have been displacement affordability and um, also dealing with two loft buildings which are adjacent to the site. And we've worked with members of the community, we've worked with, with the council member and other community stakeholders to um, significantly change the project, we think, for the better, um, and we hope to change it into something that is a model for um, future buildings that um, are built in the Bushwick area. We're committed to doing a project that's 100% affordable, and we are, um, working with Rise Borough as our community partner and our development partner. Rise Borough is uh, a local, uh, well-respected group, 
and um, a significant developer of affordable housing um, in Bushwick as well as the surrounding areas. Our proposal, um, which we're still discussing with HPD and members of the community, is um, it, it consists of two different options. One is a combined project with uh, a parking lot that is currently owned by Riseboro. It would be um, a combined project consisting of 200 units and by, by um, achieving the scale that um, is, is um, consistent with a project of this size, we're able to do significantly deeper affordability, um, <clears throat> including supportive, a component of supportive housing and units from 30% to 100% of AMI. Um, the second option is DeKalb on its own, and again, this project would, be, would still be done in partnership with Riseboro, um, using HPD's mix and match program, and this project would have units from 30% of AMI to 130% of AMI. And consistent with the HPD term sheets as well as the priorities of um, the council member and community stakeholders, we've included a mix of unit sizes, including three bedroom units for uh, families who desperately need affordable housing and don't have access to such housing um, in New York City, but specifically in Bushwick. I mentioned the two loft buildings. One of them is in IMD status, one is not in IMD status. Um, but despite whether or not the tenants are, um, and the building is legal, there are still tenants living there, and we're committed to protecting the tenants who have lot line windows as their only source of light and air. And as part of um, one of the commitments that we're making to the project, we're setting back from the loft buildings. We're going to record an easement for light and air so that the residents who live in those lot line units will continue to receive the air that they receive and the light that they receive now so that they can continue to live in the buildings. And this is something that we've discussed with, um, with a number of the tenants in the loft buildings as well as um, with other stakeholders in, in the community. And finally, we're, we're partnered with 32BJ on the project to provide good paying jobs to the building service workers. We're also committed to MWBE and local hiring. And we're going to make um, good faith efforts to hire 30% locally and also 30% um, from MWBE contractors during the construction period. We have engaged in, um, in, in significant outreach to the community. We've done a number of community sessions. We will continue to do those and continue to outreach, to do outreach efforts as we continue through the construction period. Our goal is to have at least 50% of, um, of the building, which is the community preference, um, achieved within the local community board, if not more than that. And one of the ways that we've been successful in doing that in other areas in, um, in New York City has been um, through education, outreach, and partnering with groups like our partner, Riseboro, who is um, very well connected in the Bushwick community. Um, and with that, I wanna thank everyone and thank members of the Bushwick community who are here. Um, who have had significant input into the project and I think have made it overall a better project for, for everyone involved. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of questions um, before I turn it over uh, to Councilmember Espinal. Uh, this project represents uh, an opportunity to build 100% uh, affordable housing, um, but it's also coming at a time when the community is creating its own plan for Bushwick. Uh, can you speak to how this project fits into the goals of the Bushwick Community Plan? Sure. So <clears throat> we've, in, in leading up to the ULERT process, we worked with city planning and, um, and also met with the Land Use Committee of Community Board 4. And some of the changes that we made were um, to conform the project to what um, everyone believed were the, some of the tenets of the, um, the Bushwick Community Plan. Um, namely, there are two lots, the, the, the project area, the site that we're going to build on specifically, consists of three lots. Um, two of the lots are currently zoned R6, and one lot is M-zoned. So the two lots that are currently R6, we're actually down zoning to R6B um, to maintain context with the, um, the buildings on the side streets, and that's 
consistent with, um, with what we, with the, we believe that's consistent with um, the Bushwick Community Plan. Then um, the larger lot is going, which is currently M zoned, is, is being rezoned to R7, to R7A, um, as it is closer to um, the main street of Wyckoff. The, um, specifically the issues of the, the lot buildings? Sure. Yes. So um, there have been a number, a number of concerns raised by the community related to the rezoning area. The, um, one of the major concerns is the two loft buildings. And um, what we're committed to, do, to doing is recording an easement, um, which we've discussed with, um, with land use, with city council, um, land use council, as well as with the council member and members of um, the, the existing loft buildings. So we're setting back from the lot line windows of the loft buildings, recording an easement so that um, it properly memorializes our commitment to setback and um, continue to provide light and air for the residents who live in the buildings that receive their only light and air from those lot line windows. That's, that's um, one, one commitment that we're making. Um, the other is related to the rezoning area, and the rezoning area extends beyond our site, and that was um, what we determined to be um, consistent with sound planning principles. And um, the, the lots in the rezoning area include um, a post office, they include a Spanish restaurant, a laundromat, um, and we've had conversations with the, um, the tenants in those buildings, and um, it, was our, it was our decision to go with that rezoning area um, as it's consistent with pl sound planning principles. Um, and um, at this point, it's, it's in the hands of the ULERT process and in the hands of um, city council to determine whether or not that rezoning area moves forward um, or if it gets altered. Thank you, and uh, I'm just glad to hear that uh, there is a commitment uh, to good jobs uh, on this project. Uh, with that, uh, thank you. I want to turn it over now to uh, Council Member Espinal for some questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, you know, what you're presenting here today is a, a complete 180 from what you proposed when you put in the application, right? Uh, I think it's a step in the right direction. I mean, there's a lot of still concerns about uh, a lot of these promises, uh, but what, what the experience we've had in Bushwick in the past is sometimes promises aren't promised kept, right? So how do we ensure that these conversations you're having with HPD at the end of the day um, end up with the creation of affordable housing on these sites? So we've, um, we're deep into conversation with, with HPD and with HDC about the affordability of the project. Um, we are uh, planning to um, we're, we're committed to doing the project as 100% affordable. Um, the way that HPD memorializes it is in a regulatory agreement that um, runs between HPD and um, the owner of the building, which is us. So um, the project and the commitments that we're making in terms of affordability will be memorialized in that. Um, the commitments that we're making to set back from the loft building will be in an easement that we recorded um, against the, the sites. And we're happy to also, to the extent the, um, that you and stakeholders in the community are interested, we're happy to uh, memorialize overall um, the, other, the other items that aren't picked up in those agreements in a um, community benefits agreement with, um, with your office or with the other, another appropriate party. Are there any deed restrictions? Currently? Yeah. There are no deed restrictions. Will there be, can, is it possible to get any deed restrictions if you don't comply with any of these um, promises? Um, yes, so I think the, um, the, M, the way that, um, that MIH through, um, through the ULIP process recorded is, is recorded in a restrictive declaration that um, gets recorded against the property. Um, as far as I know, the way that HPD records their restrictions is, um, is a formal agreement that is rec also recorded against the property 
um, and there are um, remedies that HPD can exercise in the event that we don't comply with those affordability restrictions. Okay. Now, going, going back to the affordability, I, I, I noticed that in uh, one of the, so you have two, two plans, right? One is to combine two separate lots, one owned by Riseboro and the current lot that we're speaking of today, which I believe creates even more affordable housing units at below 50% AMI, right? Which I think it's important, especially for the neighborhood that we're constructing in. But what I noticed is that the amount of, uh, the amount of, um, the amount of, not one bedroom, the studios is extremely high. What is, what is the reason behind that? Go forward one. Um, right, so in, in the combined plan for Cedar and DeKalb, we're um, planning to do um, about 40% supportive housing. And the way, um, the way that HPD and the state um, structure supportive housing is um, for the majority um, smaller sized units. So um, that's sort of the, the trade-off between the two the two scenarios. In, in scenario one, which is the DeKalb Cedar combined with supportive housing, there are more units, um, but the, um, the, and the reason for that is that there are more smaller units because those are the supportive units. Do, do you have an idea of how many of those units would be supportive housing units as opposed to? I don't, I, we don't know exactly right now, but the majority of, of the smaller units, well, so overall we're planning to do between 30 and 40 percent um, in the DeKalb Cedar combined version supportive housing. And the majority of those um, will be, would be um, studios in ones, so smaller sized units. I, I think I also want to want to be able to focus on the amount of three bedroom units. Um, you know, there's a lot of families in Bushwick who are looking for apartments. And, um, you know, the number right now, 10, is, I believe is a little low for the overall project. Uh, so we have to look at ways of increasing that to make sure it, it it also reflects the amount of units on the other, the amount of units in, in the other, in the other bedroom units that are being built. Um, can you talk about local hiring practices and training in greater detail? Sure. Um, so we're we're committed to um, targeting thirty percent within um, within the local community, and um, the way that we do that is partnering with local organizations. Um, Riseboro is our development partner. Riseboro will also um, work with us to identify other organizations in Bushwick. And the way that we do it is um, holding job fairs and um, identifying members of the local community, putting them onto, um, onto a list to make sure that um, they get trained. So you can't be on a job site without, um, without an OSHA card um, and without proper, without proper training. So um, members of the local community who are interested in jobs working with, um, with contractors during the construction period will, um, anyone who's not trained will, would get trained at no cost to them um, and then placed with a contractor on a job. And the overall goal is to make sure that um, as many people as possible don't only work on this job but actually get picked up by the subcontractors that they're working for and continue to the next job. So you, you mentioned that you spoke to all the businesses that are currently under this, the current zoning? We've spoken with, um, within the local area, we've spoken with um, the owner of Sasso Nunez, and we've, uh, we've spoken with the owners of Brotherhood Boxing Gym and um, the owner of the laundromat. And then the other site is owned by the post office. Um, of the two loft buildings, we have, um, we were supposed to actually meet with one of the owners of the loft buildings yesterday, um, but he was not able to show up. Um, and we've reached out to the owner of the, uh, the um, building that is in IMD status currently. And just to be clear, the proposed zoning, um, that wasn't all proposed by Camber. Half of it came from the city? No, the, um, so the, the current, the proposed zoning area was um, developed by us as we went through the ULERP, the pre ulert process. Um, we um, we went with that with that area, the full to the to the end of the block because it was determined um, that it was based on sound planning principles. Um, and um, going through the ulert process now, it's in the hands of city council um, as to 
what actually happens with the that rezoning area. Yeah, I I, I uh, have noted from day one that I have concerns with the way the the, the area is currently uh, mapped out, and uh, I'm deeply considering uh, making some changes to that at the end of the, at the end of the the day. Just to be aware. We understand your concerns. Again, the application has to meet certain sound planning principles and avoid spot zoning. So that's why the application is filed as it is. So go going back to the lofts, um, you mentioned that uh, the setback will ensure that there is going to be proper light and air in into those buildings. And there is a form of egress to ensure that it doesn't affect the people who currently live there. So the, the units currently have uh, received light and air from lot line windows. Um, those, the windows are not a legal form of egress, um, at least from, from what our consultants and experts are telling us. Um, the setback that we're providing is to continue to maintain that light and air, but it, um, and not to increase the degree of nonconformance of the loft buildings, um, but it, it will not um, actually legalize those loft buildings. The park, the parking that I see there, is that also open air? Or yes. is that a structure? Yes. Okay. And just, I guess my final question is around sustainability. Um, you know, Bushwick has uh, the poorest air quality in the city, uh, which results to high asthma rates. A lot of children in the community have, um, have been suffering for asthma. And I think now, more than ever, any development uh, should be as sustainable and as green as possible. Can you talk about the sustainability around that? Sure. And how you can help improve the conditions of, of Bushwick now with this development? Sure. So in, in this project, we've proposed, <clears throat> we've proposed to provide Energy Star appliances, LED light fixtures, low flow faucets, and other plumbing fixtures, um, condensing boilers, um, motion sensors in the hallways so that some of the lights get dimmed down when there's a lack of motion in the hallways. Um, and beyond that, one of the things that you've expressed and we've heard from other stakeholders are, um, are green roofs to the extent that's possible. And we're, um, we're committed to doing, um, to providing green roofs to help um, the heat island effect and also um, deal with some of the storm water runoff issues that are, um, that are a result of the combined sewer outflow in Bushwick and also other areas of New York City. Thank you. Um, I mean, you know, I'm going to continue looking at this project. I still have to have conversations back with the community and all stakeholders, um, but I'm sure those, con those conversations will develop in, in the next month. So thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Espinal. Uh, I now will turn it over to Councilmember. It's okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I just want to turn it over now to Councilmember Reynoso for a few questions. Yes. Uh, thank you. First, I just want to say, uh, when I first saw this plan, uh, I was extremely concerned. I'm still concerned. Uh, but when I first saw it, the fact that it even moved through was beyond me, considering the work that we're doing in the Bushwick Community Plan. Um, I am 100% behind the Bushwick Community Plan. Um, and what you're doing here kind of circumvents that opportunity. Instead of waiting to let the community tell you what they want, you felt the need to um, move forward with a plan um, without, their without their advice. So I, I wasn't a fan of that. I see a lot of the modifications you're making are, is listening to some of the community concerns, but I would rather you have you've had a relationship um, that started with the community, not ended with it. Um, and we have to start sending messages to developers that they can't just keep coming into communities and think they run the show. The community runs the show. So I just have to s stand here and at least let you know that, that I'm unhappy with the process that you part uh, partook in. The second thing is, um, in one of the buildings on the decalb only site, 60% um, of those units are gonna be at 80% of AMI and higher. If you know, the AMI in Bushwick, average AMI is about 38%. Um, which means that the majority of the people are um, uh, only would be eligible for 20% of the units on the decal site. Um, we're talking about a one bedroom for $2,400. That's 40% 40, 40 of your units in the decal site will cost $2,400 for a one bedroom. We don't consider that affordable in New York City, let alone Bushwick. So I'm really concerned with your affordability as well. And then just, um, it seems like uh, when I look at the unit count, 70% of the units are studios and one bedrooms. That's not supporting families. 
um, that live in Bushwick that are the ones that are being displaced. So I'm extremely concerned about that as well. Um, I am gonna defer deeply to Rafael Espinal, the council member whose district this resides, but because we're partners in the Bushwick community plan, I'm gonna have to hold you accountable every single step of the way. So right now I'm very dissatisfied with your presentation, I'm dissatisfied with your approach, um, and then ultimately I'm dissatisfied with the plan. So thank you for your time here. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Reynoso, and thank you to the panel for your testimony today. Uh, you are dismissed. And I will now be calling the next panel, Pamela Dupree, Devontae Jackson, Tahira Adams, Please state your name. Uh, we will have the two minute clock going. Um, and you may begin your, your testimony. You may begin whenever you're ready. Good morning, Chairman Moya, <clears throat> Council Member Espinal, and members of New York City Council Land Use Subcommittee and Zoning Franchises. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. My name is Devontae Jackson. I'm here in support of the affordable housing pro <clears throat> project proposed at 1601 DeKalb Avenue in Brooklyn. Throughout my life, I have seen a lot of changes in the community, which I live in, Bushwick, go through so many changes. Now that the community is improving, I'm not sure that there will be a way for me and my family and neighbors and friends to live there much longer. There are so many new developments projects going up every day without any affordable housing set aside for everyday New Yorkers like myself. Um, this project is different. It's 100% affordable. Um, it will create much needed housing in the community which we live in. The proposed development project will create 121 new units of quality affordable housing for families earning a wide range of income starting at $20,000 with a mix of one, two, and three bedroom apartments. This will give Bushwick families of all income levels and sizes a chance to remain in this neighborhood. Additionally, this project will create a new good paying job, as you heard earlier, um, training opportunities for local community residents. I believe that Bushwick families deserve to have access to these opportunities as well. Currently, 1601 DCAP is a vacant parking lot in a residential building. Unfortunately, outdated zoning prohibits residential development at this site. This must, this must be changed. For these reasons, I'm asking you to vote yes in support of this new project. Um, I handed in supporting documents from tenants in the surrounding areas to support Thank you for your testimony. Good morning, Chair Moya and members of the committee. My name is Tahira and I'm a security officer at the World Trade Center and I'm a member of 32BJ. On behalf of the building service workers by 32BJ in New York City, especially the 2,600 32BJ members who work and live in Bushwick, I'm here to discuss how the rezoning at 1601 DCAP will impact building service workers in the community. 32BJ is pleased to report that the developer behind 1601 DCAP, Camber Property Group, has committed to creating high quality building service jobs at the site. 32BJ believes that developments that pay building service workers the industry standard prevailing wage and benefits allow workers to live and work in a city that they love while supporting their families. 
We are pleased to say that 32BJ represents camper workers at a huge complex in the Bronx. Camper has been willing to create the kind of good jobs that can sustain a family in an increasingly expensive city. In addition to good jobs, the developer has also made an important commitment to provide affordable housing and protect the loft tenants at the site. For these reasons, we urge the council to support the rezoning application. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Moyer, Council Member Espino, and members of the New York City Council Land Use Subcommittee and Zoning Franchising. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. Currently, 1601 DeKalb is a vacant parking lot and out, outdated zoning prohibits residential development at this site. This must change. Please help the families living in Bushwick that are being forced out of their homes every day due to rising rent costs into the shelter system, which is steadily growing. I urge you to vote yes and support this proposal. Thank you. Thank you. I too submitted council some signatures from the um, residential area. Great. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you all for um, your testimony today. Uh, you're dismissed and I will be calling up the next panel. Gloria Telez Tovar. Aurelis Cruz. Nilda Baez Rivera, Jose Lopez, We don't, we don't need translation, it's, it's fine. Uh, and then the, the second thing, just to clarify, is uh, we had a couple of testimonies today. The testimonies, many of which were shared uh, based on the EAF and the original first thing in application, not today's presentation. So we're gonna go ahead and read those testimonies so that we know what we're against, and then I will close this off just to talk a little bit about what we're for based on the presentation. Sure. We'll start with, uh, is your name Aurelis? What do you want to start with? You. Oh, Gloria. Yeah. yeah. Just state your name and you can begin. Sure. My name is Gloria Teles Tovar. Thank you for having me here. So I come before you considering the proposal of 1601 decal by Cambridge Properties. Allow me to enlighten you a little bit about the Bushwick, Brooklyn. These words were taken by the statement of the community district needs issued by our community board for back in 2010. The Bushwick community has been selected to house facilities for homelessness families. It is our strongest desire to witness the construction and renovation of city-owned buildings for permanent apartments for Bushwick homelessness population. We are sensitive to the homeless pilot, however, providing the permanent apartments for those homeless people who are from the Bushwick community. We feel that it is done best by providing a port permanent apartments as proposed to the transitional type which is being proposed. And the 2013 statement said, the overall needs for Bushwick can only be described as intense. You see, Bushwick was rebuilding itself back from the blackouts in the late 70s and the massive fires and crimes and drugs afterwards. We, the people of Bushwick, pers persevered. Our requests for addressing these needs were no means exaggerated. <clears throat> we're, we're we were looking forward to the restoration of the neighborhood throughout the efforts of the city to provide the assistance and services that we desperately needed. And year after year, we requested and voices the Bushwick to not be neglected. We fought for our resources as any other district would. Bushwick was slowly but surely changing till the development boom changed it completely. And in 2018 statement issued by CB4 detailed that we were what was really happening. The Bushwick community is experiencing rapid changes in demographic, land use, economics, and most prevalent rent structures. Many of the long-standing residents are finding it quite difficult to remain in their apartment due to escalating rent expenses. Residents are being 
Residents are being illegally forced out of apartments by unscrupulous property owners with the sole mission of selling the building and rising the rents for far beyond the reach of low to moderate income families. The senior citizen population has had a 25% increase from 2000 to 2010. These numbers will continue to grow as this segment of the population continues to grow older. However, the availability of adequate living quarters for seniors has, kept, has not been kept pace to the housing crisis. I'll be done in a few seconds. Okay. We're currently trying to address neighborhood preservation through rezoning. A major uh, portion of the district is zone R6, which contributes to the developer's ability to construct edifices with are non-conforming to the height and non-contextual with other buildings within the area. Most importantly, the rents in these buildings are extra extraordinary overpriced. Consequently, community district residents are unable to afford to move into the building. The construction boom in the community has led to little or no affordability. Area residents and families are forced with doubling up to affordable rent apartments, many residents have expressed concerns the future of the neighborhood should be present and if the present trend continues, these properties usually sit on larger or an average size lots and are purchased and ultimately demolished for the development for new taller buildings with the smaller thank, units. Thank you, thank you for your testimony. The rest, I will give you a copy yeah, if you want to further read it. I appreciate it. it, thank you, thank you so much. Buenos dias, mi nombre es Arelis Cruz. Soy miembro de este camino New York y residente en la comunidad de Bushwick. No necesitamos traducción. Oh, okay. Está bien. Okay. Como líder estoy aquí para decir basta ya con el desplazamiento. Muchos de nosotros estamos a punto de perder nuestras viviendas actuales porque estamos severamente recargados. Eso es gracias a proyectos como esto. Bushwick no necesitamos, en Bushwick no necesitamos dos torres con 122 apartamentos que nadie puede pagar. Lo que necesitamos en Bushwick es vivienda asequible. Aquí lo que necesitamos en Bushwick es vivir aquí sin la presión de rentas altas y con más protección para inquilinos. Vengo de una organización que tiene 22 mil miembros y la mayoría de nosotros no ganamos, ganamos menos de 24 mil por años. La vivienda que no satisface nuestras necesidades es vivienda que no podemos apoyar. Por esos motivos, pido al que el consejo pido que el consejo rechace esta aplicación. No se puede permitir que desarrolladores como Convert Group construyan torres que no que, que solo sirve para desplazar a las familias pobres y de color. Gracias. Gracias. Aplaste el botón. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Nilda Baez. Eh, soy miembro de Se Hace Camino Nueva York y residente de Buswick. Eh, me encuentro aquí esta tarde. Soy una mujer deshabilitada y me paré hoy para estar aquí con ustedes después de, de una convalecencia que tengo. Eh, eh, también estoy aquí como una inquilina y trabajadora frustrada porque estamos hablando de un proyecto que no considera las necesidades de nuestras familias, de la comunidad de Buswick. Esta aplicación crearía 122 apartamentos, a solo 20 a 25% serán asequibles. Eh, vimos unos cambios, pero creo que no favorecen a nuestro a, a la necesidad de nuestra comunidad. Eh, eh, para la familia más necesitada, cuando consideramos la resonificación de lotes de manufactura a residencial, tiene que venir con fuertes beneficios comunitarios. La peor parte de esta aplicación es que llama a, a resonificar cinco lotes que no son propiedad del desarrollador. 
esto es algo injusto. Eh, ¿Por qué? ¿Por qué es malo? Porque primero los trabajadores en los otros lotes eventualmente perderán sus trabajos. Segundo, los inquilinos de Lot serán desplazados y perderán sus hogares, como lo vemos a diario, como lo hemos perdido nosotros también, que estamos rodando como una bola de billar eh, todavía. Entonces, eh, tercero, veremos construcción en los otros lotes que no podremos negociar mejores proyectos de vivienda para nuestra comunidad. Eh, Busui es una comunidad, como ustedes lo saben, muy pobre, aunque en estos últimos años ha cambiado bastante. Y habemos muchas personas sufriendo debido a estos cambios, porque hay muchas personas mayores de edad, eh, que, mayores que estamos pasando porque no tenemos vivienda y, y, y nuestro dinero no nos alcanza para, para pagar a veces ni siquiera lo asequible. Eh, muchos de nosotros estamos a punto de perder la vivienda también y actualmente porque estamos severamente recargados y negados a las reparaciones. Eh, no es que estamos de acuerdo, eh, estamos en desacuerdo de, del desarrollo, ¿verdad?, de nuestra comunidad, pero eh, nosotros creemos que esos cambios que se dan de resonificación, que no nos desplacen a nosotros, que no Gracias. sean incluyentes, Gracias. Que sean incluyentes para nosotros. Gra gracias. Entonces, por eso, quiero ya, de señora, último, perdón, es que sí, para tenemos decirle dos que, minutos sí, que por, cualquier por proyecto todos. que estamos en contra de esa, eh, por esa razón estoy en gracias. contra de esa aplicación. Gracias, perdón. señora, gracias, gracias. gracias. Y, por favor, ¿nos puede dar su nombre otra vez? Nilda Baez. Eh, Nilda Baez. Rivera. Ok, Gracias. Great. Uh, so I'll speak to today's uh, presentation. Uh, so as Make the Road, we've been doing a lot of work uh, on this particular site on a number of different issues. One is making sure that we can win deep affordability for the families most in need, uh, but also making sure that we're protecting both existing tenants and existing workers. Uh, so I'll start with affordability and the new set of numbers that we saw today. Uh, I will agree and say that we have seen a shift from the original presentation that we were shown five months ago. Uh, however, I think we still have a few questions. Uh, one of those questions is about deep affordability when we're looking at the joint Cedar and DeKalb site. Uh, our folks only make between $18,000 and $27,000 a year, uh, most on the lower end of that. And so there is a question about how we might be able to get more at the 30 and 40% AMI bands. So one thing we'd like to ask of Kimber is what could be the case if we took a look at either the 80 and the 100% bands, maybe bump that up to 130% AMI to see how much more units that could leverage at the 30 and 40% bands. Uh, I think the council member Reynoso said it earlier, for our folks, if it's not below 40%, it's practically market rate because they can't afford it. Uh, and so if we can get more at those lower bands, Um, I think that we could be supportive. Um, the second thing was raised earlier, and it's about the deed restriction. We have to be sure that this is absolutely guaranteed, whatever deal gets done. Uh, and so we'd like to, to recommend that Camber file a deed restriction uh, to be sure that we're guaranteed the units on this project. Uh, in terms of displacement, um, I think really it's just a matter of principle for this council. Uh, you either believe that a developer can and should apply for lots that they don't own and ask for changes, or, or you don't. Uh, five adjacent sites going up to uh, Wyckoff Avenue are not owned by this developer. And so we're requesting that all five sites be removed from the scope of this application. And the reason that that's important is because if those lots become as of right, then we lose the ability to do what we're doing now which is leveraging better deals for the community on a spot-by-spot -spot application basis to make sure that we're not stuck with standard MIH when we're looking to M to R's where developers make significant profit. 
Uh, and then the last thing is this lot line image. And so what we were told before coming in today was that there was gonna be a memorialized lot line setback to protect the tenants who have windows facing the parking lot. Uh, based on this image, which I'm seeing now, it doesn't look like there is a full lot line setback on the DeKalb and the Hart Street side. And so if the, if the walls touch and we're blocking any windows for those loft tenants, it could be the case that DOB goes in, says that they don't have egress, and asks those tenants to leave. So we'd like to see this restructured. We'd like to see a new image to protect tenants. And we'd also recommend that we pull DOB into the conversation. We really want to understand from the Department of Buildings what needs to be the case when we talk about lot lines to make sure that those tenants don't get displaced. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Gracias por estar aquí con nosotros hoy día. Gracias. Uh, the next panel we'll be calling up is Scott Short and Nem Nembe Kate. I, last name, did I pronounce it wrong? I'm sorry. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> it's Kwebe Koti. Got it. Thank you. Just state your name and you can begin. Sure. We have two um, minutes. Okay. Uh, my name is Kwebe Koti. I just wanted to submit um, letters of uh, support that we, my name is Kwebe Koti. I do community engagement for the project 1601 DeKalb. I live in Bushwick and I just wanted to submit uh, 30 letters of support that we received from the local businesses after doing outreach and uh, you know, finding out what they felt about the project and how, uh, what they thought about, uh, about the, the process. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Moya, Council Member Espinal. My name is Scott Short. I am the CEO of Riseboro Community Partnership. We're a nonprofit organization based in Bushwick with offices just a few blocks from the rezoning area in question. We've developed over 2,000 units of affordable housing in Bushwick and provide services to the community in the areas of education, homelessness prevention, health and wellness, tenant advocacy, and senior services. I also participate as a member of the Executive Committee of the Bushwick Community Plan, which, as you are aware, is a comprehensive community-led planning effort that is creating a new vision for the framework of land use and neighborhood resources in Bushwick. While I share many of the concerns that you have heard from my Bushwick Community Plan and Make the Road colleagues regarding the boundaries of the rezoning area, my testimony today will focus on the affordability of the proposed project. As originally presented, the project at 1601 DECAL roughly conformed to the minimum requirements of the mandatory inclusionary housing law. And while MIH may still prove to be a valuable tool for inducing the private sector to develop affordable housing in residential zones where none would be built otherwise, I do not believe it is an appropriate tool when manufacturing land is being rezoned to residential. In the case of private M to R rezonings, a public process confers massive value onto private land. The public benefit achieved by the minimum affordability requirements of MIH is not a sufficient trade-off for the private wealth generated by such rezonings. We must demand that communities receive more. For this reason, Riseboro has been working with Camber Property Group to try to reconfigure 1601 DeKalb as a 100% affordable project. As you heard from Camber, they are receptive to these discussions and there are currently several potential scenarios under consideration. Each of the scenarios would yield a 100% affordable, income restricted, rent stabilized building with at least 40% of units below 50% of AMI. Two of the scenarios would also include supportive housing units for frail elderly tenants. These are the types of projects that are desperately needed to stem the tide of resident displacement in Bushwick. Because discussions with community members and HPD are ongoing, we have not settled on the final proposed development scenario. However, I believe that any of the options currently under consideration set a good precedent for the kind of public benefit that communities should expect when agreeing to rezone manufacturing land for residential use. If the issues regarding the boundaries of the rezoning area can be resolved to the satisfaction of the community, 
I recommend that the Council approve 1601 decal rezoning application subject to any of the 100% affordable development scenarios. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for your testimony today. Uh, the next panel uh, is going to be uh, Gregory uh, Eloise. Nieves Medina, Gladys uh, Pu 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 Oh, come and Gladys. Uh, and I like this; it's one name only, uh, Camacho. Put my hat here, right? <laughs> you got it. Nieves. Vamos a empezar con. Mi nombre es Nieves Medina. Soy miembro de Mekena Road, New York. Eh, eh, esa aplicación, eh, eh, estoy aquí. En, en oposición de la aplicación de Campbell Group. Esta, esta eh, aplicante, eh, eh, la aplicación incluye múltiples lotes de, de manufactura, donde el aplicante no es dueño. Esto es Esto no está bien. Eh, lo, 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 lo lote de manufactura se están desplazando. En, y y el, el, el empleo actual se está disminu disminuyendo. En, e, en este caso, estamos en esta aplicación. Eh, ¿qué? Hay que me pongo nervioso. Aquí, aquí. En esta aplicación se supone, eh, se, se supone a cada eh, ¿cómo? una pérdida de trabajo de 42 trabajos. Eso, eso significa 42 familias que perderán su ingreso. Y como resultado, eh, pe pueden perder su hogar. En Busuin, 16% está desempleado. Necesitamos promover de nuevo empleo, no matar a las pocas em empleo. No puedo hacer, apoyar un proyecto que no ofrece, no ofrece asequible y no eliminar a 42 empleados. Muchas gracias, perdón por los nervios. Gracias. Creo que yo no sé si decirle buenos días o buenas tardes. Está bien, gracias buenas por tardes. Escucharme. Bueno, mi nombre es Gladys Puglia, soy miembro de Ciudad de Camino Nueva York. I stand here today in a Bushwick, as a Bushwick resident who knows all too well the struggle of the working families fighting to keep the roof over their heads. Today, applications review on the 1601 Cal Avenue is a necessary one. Three months ago, the local community board ish issued a 30 to one no vote. One month later, that on May 17, nine community groups marched in opposition to this application, joined by Assemblywoman Marixa Davila, Council Member Antonio Reynoso and Council Member Rafael Espinal. At this march, all elected officials stood in opposition to the Camber Group application, and Council Member Espinal publicly called for Camber Group to withdraw their application. Our concerns were plentiful. This plan offered no real afford affordable. The plan is to, to make tons of profit, but only, only to the community the, way, the bare minimum. The plan is to, to displace already 16 lost tenants, 
The plan is stood to displace existing workers. This plan is stood to displace essential youth services, brother, Brotherhood Boxing Club. This, will never, this plan never engaged the community. They very same concern remain through today. The camera application has not been formally amended and therefore cannot receive our support. Bushwick has already done his job of calling out the rejecting the, this pact deal and the council belief is putting communities first. It will follow our lead and no vote for this project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Robert Camacho. My family has been in Bushwick, I think more than anybody in here. My grandmother is 102, and she still lives in Bushwick. So you know how long she retired and how much she make, right? Very, 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 very low. I see everybody out there, they got shirts that says affordable. That's not affordable for seniors like us or for people that live like me all my life there. My kids can't grow in Bushwick. And if you allow this to go on, we're not gonna have our people anymore in Bushwick. Don't you guys see the picture and see what's going on with our community? In 77, when the blackout was killing Bushwick, I didn't see Camry. When drugs were killing the Latinos and black, now it's called opium, you know, only because the suburbs, our kids are getting killed with the rich money, but now we call it opium addiction. Guess what? When we were kids, we were drug dealers, crackheads, and no good. Cameron wasn't there. Think about that. We need to preserve our community. You're taking away a boxing gym. I was an amateur boxer in the 80s. I was three-time Golden Glove finalist. I went to the Olympic Regionals. I have a sister now, she's 25 years old. She's going for a doctor's degree. She's almost done with a doctorate. You know what she wants to come? Back to Bushwick to help Bushwick. You know what she tells me? I can't afford to live here. Born and raised and went to the schools here. You know 274, the schools, it's a percentage. There's only 40 kids when we should be having 80. They don't come with kids. Our people are getting pushed back. The subsidies are going away. Why? We need deeply affordable, not MIH. MIH, mandatory inclusionary housing, does nothing for Latinos and blacks. Nothing, not one cent. Two, very, very important, the parking lot. It's employees of Wyckoff. They park there. The way parking is now, where are we gonna go? Bike, we're gonna get on a bike? And bike racks and bike? It's already, in, it's already full, it's already terrible. You guys need to do something and do something now and do not approve this. Do not, I'm also on the BCP, no M to R. No M to R, we need jobs. My father was a factory worker on Lexington and Brooklyn and he was getting paid peanuts. Thank, thank you for your testimony today, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Moya and Council Member Espinal. I'm the managing attorney for Brooklyn Legal Services Corporation A's Bushwick office. Uh, that's Marty Needleman's office, and I work with, with Shaker Krishnan. And for 50 years, uh, our office has stood fighting all forms of disenfranchisement in North and East Brooklyn, and frankly, even in other places where that comes up, uh, including other parts of the city. Uh, and we stand in opposition, remind particularly Council Member Espinal, but the entire council of an opportunity you have for democratic power. And I think there are three ways which this application speaks to that. Number one, as has been uh, stated earlier, there is a Bushwick community plan, and that is one of these uh, Charter 197A plans that the City Planning Commission has routinely thrown out of the window and disregarded for years. You have an opportunity now to give power to those plans by saying, when an application comes in your community and if it doesn't line up with the community's express plan, that gets dumped. The second piece of power to remind you all in this council is government's capacity both to create social ills and to fix them. 
Remember that in 1994, it was this council's decision in part, and what we know from reading books like The Color of Law and Evicted, but it was this council's decision on high rent deregulation that created in part the preservation uh, crisis that we have. So in this application, in terms of having your power, you have a tool with, called a rezoning or the ability to approve land use. Use that tool to have what we consider in Bushwick sound planning principles, people over buildings. The sound planning principles mean that we keep Bushwick the way it is with the people, that government power, that government tools are used to benefit people, and that's what this application allows you to do, uh, this opportunity. I want to remind you of that, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank, thank you all for your testimony today. I will be calling up the um, next panel. Okay, let's go. Uh, Marcel Negret, May Maybelline Navarro, and Astrid Rengifo. Is that right? Thank you. Just state your name and um, you may begin your testimony. Hello, my name is Marcel Negret. I have been living in the same block, DeKalb Avenue in Bushwick for almost a decade. I'm a loft tenant and today I'm representing the interests of my neighbors. Uh, since the public review started, there has been significant, significant changes to this pro to the proposal. However, I'm still very concerned about some issues and I know that many of my neighbors are, are as well. I respectfully request the council to work with Camber to address the following concerns. First, regarding the rezoning boundaries, uh, we urge the council to exclude the loft buildings from the rezoning and leave them as an M1 district instead of an R6 or R7. Leaving the zoning as M1 in the loft buildings would alleviate pressure from speculators buying the property, trying to build something twice as big, and displacing tenants in the process. It seems that there's a consensus as to exclude the laundromat, post office, and Sison Nunez from the rezoning as to avoid a similar situation. The rationale for rezoning the loft buildings argues that this will be the only mechanism to bring the buildings into compliance. However, there are other mechanisms different than the rezoning for both loft buildings to meet MDL requirements. As dozens of other loft buildings in the area, the legalization of the loft building in Lot 41 could be achieved through a zoning variance with the Boards of Standards and Appeals. In addition, a proposed bill amending and extending the loft law has gained consensus at the state legislation, at the state senate. Uh, the rezoning itself will not bring these buildings into compliance, but it will create speculation. Because of this, we request for the loft buildings to be removed from the rezoning as well. Second, regarding the light and air easement agreement, the side yard as currently proposed is still problematic. Residents from the A units of the building on lot 41, those units that are closer to the DeKalb Avenue side, would still see all their windows blocked, eliminating, eliminating their access to light and air. We urge for Camber to maintain a minimum 15 foot setback all along the northern property line. This light and air easement agreement should be maintained in perpetuity or at least maintained for the entire duration of the property lease given to Camber. Finally, it would be important to consolidate the written document or the DOB form that describes the duration and the mits and bounds of this agreement. The document should, should be included in the community benefits agreement and committing to record the language as is with the Department of Buildings before building permits are submitted. Thank you. So, Th thank you for your testimony. Excuse me, ma'am. You, you may begin. Just state your name. Hi. Hello. Good morning. My name is Maybelline, and, I've w and I'm one of the many young people in Bushwick. No, let me change that. I'm one of the many young people in New York City who has experienced the effects of gentrification in our neighborhoods. See, the thing is, I've lived in multiple apartments in DeKalb, been displaced from those apartments because my family could no longer afford the rent. I've walked from DeKalb to Myrtle Ave for many years, and it's disheartening to see that the businesses I used to pass are no longer there. For example, the 99 cent store I used to shop at turned into a restaurant. It infuriates me to see the apartments being built because it represents more families who were displaced and mistreated 
Too often, black and brown families have to bear the burnt of displacement, and it saddens me. Our demands are simple. I want to see housing that my parents can afford, can afford, not rents that will force us to spend all our income on rent. Second, I want to protect the commercial spaces we have on Wyckoff, like Brotherhood, Brotherhood Boxing Club and Sazon Nunez, spaces for families and youth of color. This nine-story complex destroys a piece of the community that has lived there for years, destroying the lots that they, the developers, don't own. It will push the bus drivers who I see eat at Sazon Nunez Diner. It will push out nurses and doctors who use the parking lot. It pushes out families who use the laundromat. It pushes out the youth who have relied on the boxing club as a form of release. So I ask, where will we go? Where will they go? Where will my peers go? This nine-story complex will drastically affect black and brown families that are already financially struggling to live there. An emphasis on the word families because youth will and have been the ones to receive the backlash of all of this. We are the ones who see the strain on our families' faces after coming home from a job that pays them just enough to continue living. See, some of us come from households that live paycheck to paycheck. Some of us were asked to take on a job even, to balance school and work. And as young people, we, get, we don't get much of a say on these matters. We are left to deal with the results of it. We are left to assist our parents in the transition of the neighborhoods. So hear me as I speak out that we don't need an unaffordable nine-story complex in the neighborhood. We demand a no in this project. Thank you. Honorable members of the City Council, my name is Astrid Bringifo, and I'm a resident of Bushwick at 1609 DeKalb and adjacent loft building to the proposed development site at 1601 DeKalb. Thanks to the support of our local representatives, Council Member Espinal, Assembly Member Maritza Davila, our Community Board Number 4, and community organizations like Make the Road New York, and the participation of hundreds of people from our Bushwick community, we have seen, after a very disappointing start, a willingness from Cambert Property Group to take into account some of the issues we exposed at the beginning of the process. Notwithstanding, the law tenants at 1609 Hall are still at risk of being displaced. To this time, a setback proposal has been made verbally by, by Camber, but a comprehensive binding agreement with the Tenants Association and the owner of the building is yet to be seen. Moreover, the latest setback proposal will not prevent the tenants from being displaced. At least six units between the buildings would all lose access to light and air, as you can see in the drawing over there. As urged by Borough President Adams, the new development must have an acceptable setback all across from the northern property line and secure assurances that love habitability issues are addressed. Besides, the rezoning proposal will put our building at, I'm sorry, at risk of being sold by potential harassment or market speculation with no guarantee or protection for us tenants. I strongly urge that our loft building at 1609 DeKalb to be removed from the 1601 DeKalb rezoning proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank all of you for uh, coming here today. Uh, we have now our last uh, panelist, uh, Stephanie Cancel. You know when the clock starts. I guess it starts when I start, right? Oh. So my name is Stephanie Cancel, and I represent the Bushwick community. I've been a Bushwick resident for 26 years of my little life, and um, three generations of my family grew up here. Now, as you've heard other people express, uh, this is an extremely detrimental to our community, and it's imperative that we require deeper affordability. Now, they say that, the, the, you know, it'll be beneficial to the community, but the unit predominantly studios and one bedrooms. And if you know anything about Bushwick, you know that we have families. Bushwick is where families are, are grown and nourished. And to put market rate units in there means that for a family of three, uh, at 80% AMI, they have to earn $112,000 in 800. Stephanie, one, one second, please. 
Folks, can you take your conversation outside or please wait till the panelist is done? Seconds on my clock. Ten extra seconds on that. <laughs> no, but seriously, um, um, single parents with children, um, elderly, young people at risk. I'm a student. I go to school in Texas. And when I get my degree and I come back to Bushwick, I'm not going to be able to live there. Um, and this is, this is something that, that means a lot to me. And it's gotten to the point where I've, I, I work for a nonprofit organization called Churches United for Fair Housing. And I appreciate um, you standing in solidarity with us um, as much as you do. And I organized a month worth of protests. Right, a month worth of protests of the, the city for uh, continuing to perpetuate racial segregation for these developers and these landlords who come into the neighborhood that is impoverished and bring in market rate units that we know are displacing our people at a disproportionate rate. I scheduled a month of actions. There's no organization that's doing that. And every single day we target one building, one developer, and we call them out and we highlight the city. There are market rate units that go up every single day. And the homelessness rate is over 90,000, and that's only on record. So imagine the families that aren't on record. Imagine the immigrants. Imagine the people who, who simply in Bushwick don't make enough. 60% uh, uh, at 80% AMI is not affordable at all. We need deeper affordability levels for the people who currently live there and not the hipsters, the new, uh, the new residents who can afford to pay $2,400 or $3,200 for an apartment. We need deeper affordability for our people, and we need it now. And you guys are in a position to make sure that that happens for us, and I'm sure that you see what's going on and you know what the problem is, and we're going to continue to fight and resist and oppose things like this, and we hope that you vote in opposition as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. <laughs> Uh, are there any members of the public who uh, wish to testify? Seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on this application, uh, and it will be laid over. Uh, this concludes today's hearing. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the members of the public, my colleagues, and of course, always the great uh, land use staff and our council um, for helping us get through today. Uh, with that, uh, this meeting is adjourned.